David Morgan of TheMorganReport.com joins us today to talk about silver. David, gold has hit all-time highs this year. Why hasn't silver? Why haven't we seen $50 silver? Oh, you're going to put me right on the spot, David. Well, thank you for having me. Silver's been lagging gold. It varies from time to time which metal leads. Actually, at times, silver can lead gold. It's not always gold leading silver. But under the current conditions economically, gold is basically a mainstream investment, even though most people don't think of it that way. Central banks have been net buyers of gold since the 2011, since 2011. So for the last nine years, they've been net buyers of gold. Recently in this year, we've seen a huge input to the ETFs in silver. So silver just hasn't had the safe haven status that gold enjoys until recently. And so there's just been basically the bifurcation I call the silver where sometimes it's just, oh, it's just an industrial commodity. And there's other times where it's never just a monetary metal, but it has that component to it. And we established that in March of this year, David. So it's playing catch up. As you well know, we saw the all-time uh, high for a gold-silver ratio that was probably hit once again, once in the 30s, again in uh, this year of about 125 ounces of silver to buy one ounce of gold. Now we're around 80 or slightly less, which means silver has outperformed gold this year and I expect that to continue and to repeat myself for the only reason that there's a large monetary demand into silver now and it will continue. We're going to talk about your monetary uh, policy outlook in just a bit. But going back to $50 of silver, when was the last time that happened? And were the uh, drivers of that run up then still in place today? Great question. It happened in 1980 and it was you know blamed on the hunts and I don't have time to go into it, but it did spike to that level intraday. It reestablished near that level, didn't actually hit the five zero, but very close to it. Or if you want to do in the futures, it did. And that was the end of April, early May 2011. And will it do it again? The answer is yes. In fact, I think it'll go through it the next time. And what was in place in 2011 was that QE2 was announced, David. And so silver had gone from the 19 level channel formation that I traded uh, futures contracts on and gave it to my paid, paid subscribers that get to look over my shoulder. And on that breakout, we drifted all the way up to 26. So we had a $7 profit on a leveraged uh, position, which was pretty healthy. And I was going to stop out at 26. In fact, I took profits. And then QE2 was announced, and I got right back in. because The market knows more than I ever. And then we wrote it from 26, and I called it within a couple of days of the top. So we went from 26 all the way up to 48. So that whole move was $19 to 48 on a leverage position. And I had people that left the report and retired. So I uh, got that one right. I wouldn't say get them all right, but if you're going to get one right, you want to get a big one right. So what was in place was that people thought this inflation was going to come into Main Street. It's said, oh my goodness, QE2, they're flooding us with paper, inflation everywhere. But that's not what happened. And that's why silver went to that peak and came back down and really went nowhere except down for the ensuing several years because that money was static. It only went to help the banking system. It never hit Main Street, only Wall Street. And because of that fact and the subsequent uh, QEs, Operation Twist and everything else they did to purchase one end of the bond curve to try to quote unquote help the economy only helped the rich, didn't go into the actual physical economy. Once that was realized, then people backed off the silver because the inflation really wasn't there uh, in, in, their, you know, in their domain. I mean, what I want to say is it didn't materialize the way people expected it to. Is silver as much of an inflation hedge as gold is? You brought up inflation. So what's your take on silver's role in mitigating inflation? Really not my take. I did a lecture in Vancouver at the Cambridge House years ago, probably the most boring lecture I've ever done, but it was based on two books, The Golden Constant and Silver, the Restless Metal by Professor Roy S. Jastrom. And he looked over centuries on both the metals, on what do they do under inflation and deflation. 
And the bottom line is gold is the best in a deflation. Silver is, has mixed results, but in inflation, there's nothing better than the silver market. Right. So what's your outlook then on inflation over the next year well, and a half? Is, uh, yeah. Well, you said, what are the, all the factors in place? And the answer is yes. And this time it's different because this time the money is going into the, into the main street. You've got basically a UBI going on. They don't call it that yet. We all know what universal basic income is, but you've got forbearance where you don't have to pay on your mortgage or your rent payment. You're getting uh, these unemployment checks that are basically buffered up. Some people are making more in unemployment as it, than they were when they were working. And so you're basically seeing the money come into the people at this point in time. And I think that will continue under different subsidies and different programs. We're talking about this you know, Fed coin or this uh, central bank digital currency, where basically you're going to get a wallet, you're going to get you know, free money, more or less. And this has been tried over and over again in monetary history not quite as in a sophisticated way where it's on your phone and you, you know, just basically floats in the uh, neurosphere through the, through the web and, uh, you know, magically lands in your account. Nonetheless, they've tried printing wealth or mitigating the economic uh, anomalies by just, you know, papering over it or printing their way out of it. And it doesn't work. It won't work again this time, but what will happen is it's going to be inflationary at all levels, especially on Main Street, and people will start to react to that. A lot of economists I've spoken to have agreed with you on that point. They all think that inflation is coming. Well, not all, but a lot of people think that inflation is coming short and long term. And as a result, gold's going to go a lot higher. I wonder, when you make your silver forecast, do you base that at all on your outlook on gold? Do you just apply a multiple of where gold's going to go to silver? Uh, or is, are they completely independent studies? No, they do correlate. Silver is 85% correlated to the price of gold. So you have to look at gold if you're going to analyze it properly. But they do have different functions. As I said, gold's best for preserving wealth. I mean, if you're a gold holder and you have the right percentage in your portfolio, you can rest better at night. Silver can uh, beat you up both directions, especially if you're short when it's rocketing up or vice versa. So silver is an adjunct to gold. It's sort of like buying the blue chips and then putting something into the NASDAQ. You're going to get a lot higher rate of return potentially, but you're also going to have a lot more volatility. So I look at the gold as kind of a baseline, kind of a trendsetter and see what the rhetoric is and see how often the Wall Street types or the mainstream financial channels talk about gold. And that's going to give me some insight into what the longer term picture is going to look like and silver will come up behind it. So there's a lot to think about, but you don't have to make it very complex. Uh, but we do need to see certain levels in silver technically before I can get real excited. So let's assume that gold is going to go a lot higher, which according to a lot of analysts, it will in the long term. I've heard $4,000 in three years. I've heard $10,000 in five to 10 years. Let, let's just take $4,000 in three years. And that's about a 2x times multiple from where we are now. Uh, wouldn't that, couldn't that multiple be applied to silver as well? We're going to see at least two times growth in the next three years. Yeah, usually you'll see silver outperform and I expect that. I mean, the last time we had that run in silver in 2011 that you and I just spoke about, David, we'll look at uh, probably something similar. So at that time, it got to a ratio of about 33 to one. So if we use $4,000 gold and we use a ratio of like 40 to one, you're still looking at, you know, 40 into 4,000. That says $100 silver. Is that out of the question? I don't think so. I actually forecast that price back in 2003 when silver was under $5. So I think we'll see that. I'm not saying next year, but we'll see that. And you said, what, two years out or something, 4,000 or three, whatever it is, I'm just doing the math in my head to tell you that's what, what I expect it to do. Okay, 40 to one gold to silver ratio is what you just brought up. That's, uh, you were right, that's nearly half of uh, where we are today. Uh, we're sitting right under 80. So what should be the fair gold to silver ratio in your opinion? If it's a industrial commodity with some monetary value, which is where we're at now, it would be probably in the 30 to 1 ratio. If it were treated like gold, and I did some lectures on that, as you know, what if gold, what if silver was treated like gold and was with its best performance is money? If that were the case, then a 16 to 1 ratio is now the question, or even a 10 to 1 ratio, which would match pretty close to the natural ratio that comes out of the ground. 
So it just depends mostly on what the perception is. As you said, there is going to be inflation in a lot of uh, necessary goods, food uh, and other areas. But there's going to be deflation in like a lot of leverage positions. I mean, you're going to see like some commercial real estate come down. You're going to see some general real estate come down. You're going to see a lot of this over leveraged situations and especially the bond market. That's where I'm the most concerned. So once the bond market starts to react to the basic overall economic uh, positions that everyone's holding, meaning that the United States debt is sacrosanct. There's nothing safer. Once it's realized, it's really not safe. And interest rates are really a reflection of not only return, but also risk. So right now, if you're getting basically a 0% return, it's telling you the currency is worthless. I mean, if you have a negative interest rate in the future, it's telling you the currency is worthless. But no one is bold enough to come onto the mainstream financial press and make those statements. But if it's worth zero in the future, uh, then what's it worth now? And of course, this is something that you know sounds preposterous. That I'm not saying you know burn your dollars on your front lawn. What I'm trying to imply is what the major trend is, and the market hasn't recognized it yet, but it's starting to. Gold is giving subtle clues. Silver is giving subtle clues. The asset classes are giving subtle clues. And the stock market, in my view, is on thin ice, meaning that it's just a few handful of stocks that are overbought that tend to bring the industrial averages or the S&P averages up. But the on balance volume, what the overall total stock market picture looks like, is fairly bleak. Uh, I've read some research reports that uh, indicated that silver has not always performed well historically during recessions. And I think that what, what the report implied is that the industrial component has kicked in, and if industrial demand is down, silver prices would also follow. First of all, do you agree with this analysis? And second, if you do, shouldn't you wait until after this current recession is over before you invest in silver? Well, I agree with the first part of the statement. I mean, that's pretty much a fact. But no, I wouldn't wait because what's going to happen is the monetary aspect is going to kick in, which I mentioned earlier, that we've had more investment demand in silver this year than we've had in the last 30 years on a percentage basis. We've had so much investment demand in silver this year that it's pretty much matched industrial demand. So industrial demand accounts for about 50% of the silver market and has for the last several years. And investment demand is usually only 10% of the silver uh, demand. This year, the industrial demand is down about 10%. We guess, we don't know until you know, the numbers are tallied, but let's say it's off to uh, 45%. Well, about half of silver's demand this year has been monetary demand, and we're just getting warmed up because as we've discussed, I think next year we're gonna see more pressure on currency inflation or destruction, devaluation, more printing, more basically destroying the currency, the currency crisis that we're already in, this reset that's going on. And there'll be a lot of investors that will be waking up and seeking an asset that protects them. As we discussed between uh, earlier with Professor Jastrom, that the best place to be in those conditions are going to be in silver for uh, a high inflation rate. So I think that, uh, yeah, you could have a recession, but the monetary man will definitely overwhelm it. Facts are on my side so far because that's been the case this year. There's no disputing that. Okay, that was my next question. Excellent point. So let's assume for the sake of argument that we're going to have a continuous recession. Maybe things will be even worse. Demand for industrial metals will be even lower than it is now. Let's just make that assumption. But at the same time, we're going to get a lot of monetary stimulus. In that case, what would be a stronger force on silver? The upwards monetary stimulus from money printing or the downwards force of a recession and to drag down an industrial demand? What a great question. What will happen is if I'm right and the monetary or investment demand continues as strong as it was this year, next year, even though industrial demand is off and measurably off, it will put a squeeze on the remaining physical supply, which means that these industries, even though they're not producing as many iPhones or laptops or DVD players or heaters on the back element of your window or the EV cars that use a lot more silver than a conventional automobile, even though the production rate is down, they still absolutely must have silver. It's essential. It's critical. There's no substitute. 
So what will happen is if the investors dry up all the physical silver, the companies that are left to produce will have to buy it or they're out of business. So that'll be a compounding effect that even in a recession, they will pay anything. If you've got $2 worth of silver in a $1,000 iPhone, if silver goes up 10 times, it only costs you 20 bucks of worth of silver to produce a $1,000 iPhone. They could care less what the price is, but they have to have it. So when you get that added pressure into the silver market under those conditions, you're going to really see what I call double parabolic. You're going to see a move pretty much straight up at some point. I'm not saying next year. It'll probably be 2022 or 2023. But once that kicks in and all of a sudden the physical supply is dried up to the point where the industrial users realize, uh uh-oh. And this already happened, David. I think we recall uh, off record, we talked briefly one time about the palladium market. And that's what happened when Ford Motor Company switched from platinum to palladium in their catalytic converters. They didn't know how tight, how small the market was. They phoned up their logistics department and said, hey, give us this much palladium. It took the price from the hundreds of dollars an ounce to $1,100 an ounce. So that's the type of thing that could happen in the silver market. Right. Well, is there a risk of, uh, of, of a complete drop off of industrial demand for silver in the long term? Look at what happened to uh, photography post 80s when you know, we had cameras that used to actually take film. It required silver and dig- the advent of digital cameras kind of just killed that off completely. Do you see any such risks today? I don't see them, although graphene is something to consider, but I have taken the big picture to heart because my predecessor was Jerome Smith, and he made the big mistake of not looking ahead and seeing a technological change in the mining industry. He said $200 silver by 1995, and if there wasn't this big technological shift in mining, he might have been proven correct. So I've always held that to heart that there could be something out there that I don't see that could cause such a shift in the market that I've proven wrong. So yeah, basis today and all that I know, that's my projection. If there's something that comes along like graph, graphene, I said it's essential, it's a must, you have to have silver, there's no substitute. Well, if there is a substitute, then I have to check my premises and say, hey, David, please put me back on for an interview. I want to let everybody know that graphene is taking over the silver market and this, you know, the industrial man's gone to zero. I don't see that happening, but I am very cognizant of it. And again, I have to commend you. Excellent question. You're really thinking deeply on this subject and not that many do. So thank you. Well, (laughs) thank you. Let's take a look at the uh, supply and demand balance here. The Silver Institute is forecasting uh, still a net surplus this year, but down from last year. So they're forecasting 14.7 million ounces of surplus uh, versus 31.3 in 2019. So... You know, supply is still outweighing demand, but less so. Why do you think there's less de- uh, less supply this year? Well, I think we've discussed that off air. I mean, there's less supply because of the mine closures, so we know that. Uh, that's a main reason. And then as far as the surplus is concerned, it depends how you account for it. I mean, it's really tough. I mean, there's another study by CPM Group, and I get them both, one you pay for, one you get for free, and I pour into them pretty hard. And usually have my own analysis, but that's basically the best record that we we have. And I think most of the numbers are pretty accurate. No one knows to the ounce how much. You might know what a mine produces to it through the ounce, but you don't really know what the hedge books are doing. And you know, there's so many other factors. But I think generally speaking, you know, supply and demand meet every year. And if you go from 1990 to 2006. There was a deficit in silver, but supply has to meet demand. And that took the stockpile of above ground silver from 2 billion ounces down to 500 million over 15 years. Since that time, we've been seeing the above ground stockpile of silver increase, but most of it's held by long term investors. And as I said earlier, the industrial side doesn't stockpile any silver, it's just in time inventory. But if they get scared because the supply gets uh, you know, taken up by the investment side, they're going to have to go into the market. They'll probably buy more than just just in time inventory. They'll get concerned that they can't get it, and they'll bid up the price even higher, as I mentioned earlier. Okay. Uh, finally, let's take a look at short term impacts on silver. Now, uh, the election's coming up. That's obviously the big news driving the markets today. Do you think the election will have any impact on silver? Yeah, somewhat. I think if um, the Democrats get in, then you might see uh, an acceleration in the price. 
uh, that's somewhat greater, but really from the monetary aspect, it matters little who's in office. There's so many structural problems within the basic economy that regardless of monetary policy, it's been uh, it's been corrupted for so long. In other words, you know, the idea of balancing the budget was passed in the law and in the United States. And every year, the Congress critters get together and they vote in a new debt limit. So what good is this law? It's worthless. And so whether we print, you know, three trillion more or six trillion more, there's a point of no return. And I think we've already reached that. That's why you're starting to see gold and silver signal what's ahead. And again, it looks like currency destruction or at least a currency crisis. Doesn't mean the dollar's going to zero. It's not. The central banks are going to have the central bank digital currency. They'll mitigate the problem as much as they can. The reset will have something to do with how money is is uh, transacted in the future. You may even see a push toward uh, zero cash and everything that's basically in the digital form. Perfect. David Morgan, thank you so much for coming on the show today and uh, giving us your insights. I appreciate it. David, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. That was David Morgan of the morganreport.com. I'm David Lin. Stay tuned for more. <laughs>